Uh, okay, so let's start the second lecture about integrability. So yesterday I talked about uh, uh, how the integrability or Yambach's equation is related to the existence of the infinitely many conserved charges and also how to use the Yambach's equation to fix some interesting S matrix, uh, which is the uh, S matrix O and uh, nonlinear sigma model. And today, uh, I'm going to talk about, so yesterday I was talking about one plus one dimensional system, and now today I'm going to talk about uh, how the integrable system uh, arises from three plus one dimensional system, which is n equals four super mu theory in four dimensions. So let me give you a brief review of what the n equals four super mu theory. Of course, I don't have time to explain the detail of the theory, but I will just uh, kind of list the necessary properties uh, for the lectures today and tomorrow. So, the first of all, n equals 4 super mu theory is uh, 3 plus 1 dimensionals gauge theory, and it has maximally supersymmetric. So, it has a max, max, maximal number of supersymmetry. And another important property, and that's the reason why I'm talking about this theory in this school, is that uh, this is actually conformal field theory. And in addition to the conformal symmetry, it has some global symmetries. And one of the important global symmetry is SO6R symmetry. And, and of course, as I said, this theory has supersymmetry as well. So we need to combine like a disconformal symmetry and SO6R symmetry with a supersymmetry. And, and in particular, if you combine supersymmetry and conformal symmetry, you will find superconformal symmetry. And in the end, whole global symmetry of this group can be packaged into what's called PSU22 uh, slash four symmetry. And this is a super group. And this SU2 slash 2 part is essentially SO4, 2, uh, which is the conformal symmetry in 3 plus 1 dimension. And this SO, SU4 is essentially this SO6 R symmetry. So this is the symmetry of the theory. And let me now, okay, so let me now describe the, okay, yeah, let's, dis let's use this blackboard. Let, let me now use the field content of the theory. So the field content of the theory so it has uh, six real scalars. Which, denotes, which I denoted by pi i, and, and eight fermions. Uh, but I actually, I'm not going to use fermions in my lecture, so I'm not going to talk about the detail of it. But, and of course, in addition to that, I have a gauge field, a mu. And importantly, all these fields are related by the supersymmetry with each other. And this in particular means that all fields are in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And throughout my lecture, I'm going to assume that the gauge group is UN. Okay, and so, so this is the basic uh, property of the theory, and now I'm going to, now I'm going, okay, so, and today I'm going to study the theory in the so-called large n limit. So, in, which is defined by 
sending the color to infinity and keeping this combination fixed. And as you all know, probably, so in this limit, uh, the leading contribution is given by Feynman diagrams. I think I might be the only one who talks about Feynman diagram in, in this school, actually. <laughs> so the Feynman diagram, which, can, which you can draw on a sphere. So for example, this one, so this is the usual double line notation, and each double line represents the propagator of some field in, uh, in this n equals 4. That the leading ones are the ones that you can draw on the sphere. And for example, there are also non, so this one and this one are leading ones, but on the other hand, there are some other diagram, something like this. And which is, which is subleading. So this is suppressed by one of INC in the large n limit. And the basic reason is that, for example, let's compare this and this because it has the same number of vertices. Then you see that uh, there is an index loop one, two, three, and four. So it has four index loop, this diagram. So this diagram comes to n to four, whereas this diagram only has uh, one, sorry, one and two and three. So it has index loop. Uh, three index loops, and each index loops gives you NC, so you can see that this diagram is suppressed as compared to this diagram. Just two? Yes, yeah, just two, right. Yeah, and okay, so you, you need, okay, to really count the uh, number of, the power of N, you need to do a little bit more careful analysis, taking into account what you're fixing is this one. But OK. Anyway, the point that I wanted to make is that the right diagram is suppressed by some power of 1 of n. OK, so, and so this was like a diagrammatic simplification. And also, but uh, also from the CFT data point, the point of view of CFT data, large n limit actually simplifies a little bit the CFT data. Uh, because in the large n limit, uh, the operator, the main operator that you want to, okay, so the most important, op there, are, there is a class of operators, which is the most important in the large n limit, which is called single trace operator. And they are basically composite operator. So the, I so the idea is to multiply these fundamental fields it can be fermion, it can also have some uh, covariant derivatives, and then take the trace. And of course, I, this is a composite local operator, I want to put all the fields at the same position. And by doing so, you can easily see that this is a gauge invariant operator because all the fields are in the adjoint representation. And the reason why we care about the single trace operator is, that, is because in the large n limit, uh, other operators, for example, you can also consider the double trace operators. But the dimension of this double trace operator is precisely the sum of the dimension of the constituent single trace operator up to one over n correction. So that's why we only, uh, the main thing, the, the first thing we need to understand is the uh, dimension and the structure constants of the single trace operators. Okay. So where is my chalk? Okay, it's here. All right, so yes, so far so good, I guess. And let me now, So, so far I've been talking about basics and let me now talk about more interesting stuff. <laughs> so.
So So the goal of my lecture today is to do some perturbative analysis of the spectrum of the single trace operator and discover some relation with the spin chain. So let's first consider for simplicity So let's discuss first general generalities. So for, let's first consider for simplicity the op single trace operators made up of just scalar fields. So the typical form of this operator is given by something like this. And I just assume that all the fields inside the trace are scalars. So for each field, there are basically six choices because we have six real scalars. And of course, like a, well, this kind of operator looks, uh, looks okay because it's gauge invariant and it's indeed okay at tree level. So tree level, this is okay. But there is of course a problem at loop level because uh, at loop level, So let's call it O B. If you insert this O B inside some correlation function, then if you just insert and do the computation, you will, you will find divergence. And precisely because uh, we are putting a field, multiple fields at the same position, so there is a divergence coming from that, yes. Sorry, by tree and loop, C means still in the planar limit. Right, so today I'm only gonna, going to talk about planar limit. So tree means lambda to zero, and one loop, for example, means lambda to one. Uh, okay, uh, well, things factorize, but things factorize into two-point function. So that's the large n factorization. So if you have a, like a single, like a correlation function of single trace operators, then it factorizes into the two-point function. But even at the two-point function level, you see the divergence. And essentially the, okay, so I'm gonna talk about where the divergence comes from, if, if it's not so clear. Yeah. Okay, so of course, uh, <laughs> we know how to cure this problem. It just, it's just telling us that we need to renormalize. And how do, you, how do we renormalize the operator? Okay, of course this is just a textbook computation, but let me just uh, explain the outline of the computation. So the first thing you need to do is to compare this OB. So the reason I put B is because this is bare operator before the renormalization. So first compute the correlation function involving this B uh, and in uh, regularized theory. So if you do, it, do the computation naively, then it diverges. So we, you need to regularize. You can use dimension, dimensional regularization or you can use some momentum cutoff. And the second step is to define a renormalized operator uh, by, so all renormalized is given by ZAB. So this is the uh, multiplicative renormalization. So this is a bare factor. And this ZAB, Uh, of course, depends on the cutoff that you. So, so the second step is to define the renormalized operator in such a way that this correlation function becomes finite. Sorry. Ah, okay. So A and Bs are okay. Essentially, in the process of multiplicative renormalization, different operators can mix. So it's just the labels for different operators. Ah, 
Okay, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Let's do it this, this way. What's your take on these less precise papers that refer to PCM nodes as a finite series? Less precise, sorry, less, less precise paper? <laughs> well, it, it's <laughs> right, so, okay, so, uh, so for example, like uh, if you compute the beta function, then it's really finite and then like uh, you can define it without renormalization and the coupling constant doesn't run. But uh, the fact that it's finite doesn't exclude uh, the composite operator renormalization. So it's a slightly different thing. So you're just talking about diagrams that introduce beta functions. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, it, basically that's. Yeah. Uh, in that particular paper, yes. Okay. okay, so, right, so, so, okay, the second step is to define the, yes. A and B are from one to six. That's Sorry, A and B are, no, one, not one to six, because it's the label of the operator, so it's like a six to something in this case. So, so the idea is to define the renormalized operator in such a way that this correlation function become fi becomes finite. And in order to do that, of course, like uh, this um, renormalized factor itself must depend on the cutoff because it has to cancel the cutoff dependence in this Bayer operator. And typically it takes this form. Uh, in a, so I have A and B here, where this lambda is a, just a cutoff. And uh, cutoff dependence typically exponentiate uh, in n equals four, and and this h, okay, h is of course just defined by d log z over d log lambda. Uh, okay, so the everything I said so far applies also to other operators, but. Uh, I'm saying if you want to renormalize step one, yeah. um, is there a deep point you could do it like? That's a good point. So uh, at one loop, if you just consider this operator, uh, this operator mixes among themselves. So, the, so in a sense, like uh, this sector is closed at one loop, but that's actually not true if you go to higher loops. So in higher loops, you do need to consider other operators involving fermions and so on. Okay, so, so this was just a generality, but, uh, but let's see. So what I'm going to do is do some explicit one loop computation and one loop in lambda. And let's see what we expect, uh, expectation at one loop. So we basically follow these two steps. So as a first step, we put some Bayer operator. In particular, let's consider a two-point function. And at the tree level, uh, this two-point function is just, uh, you can compute it by weak contraction because it's tree level. And it typically takes something like this. So the two operators uh, gives you some orthogonal basis, and then the power is fixed by classical dimension of these operators. And at one loop, uh, what you expect is log, because all the coupling constant uh, in n equals four super mu theory has dimensionless, is dimensionless. And you, have, you expect some logarithmic divergence at one loop, and of course, this logarithmic divergence, in order to put really something inside log, you need to uh, consider the dimensionless combination. And the only uh, way to do so for this two-point function is to multiply it by x12, which is the length, uh, the distance between two operators. So this is our expectation at one loop. 
of course, like there can be higher order correction. So this is the step one. And the point is that at one loop, there can be non-trivial mixing between different operators, and this doesn't have to be diagonal, even if you choose the basis to be diagonal in, at tree level. The gamma one is proportional to little lambda. Right. Uh, sorry, the little, yes, 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 little lambda. So this is order <coughs> lambda. So this is just a general expectation from field theory. And essentially, from in this picture, the step two is a kind of trivial. Essentially, what you need to do for the step two is to, this is in, in principle matrix, so that, that what you need to do is diagonalize gamma one, two, and just remove this log dependence. Remove log lambda, the cutoff dependence. Is this one is delta or is the classical Yes. Correct. So we need, so that's basically the step two. And after the step two, uh, what we have here is of course very simple. So now after the renormalization, you you again get the same structure. So the leading term is delta. Okay, so now, because you diagonalize it, everything is proportional to delta function, our Kronecker delta, and the leading term is this one, and then you get some uh, two times uh, uh, gamma. Now this is basically the eigenvalue. And then, I, because I removed log, log lambda, so what remains is just dependence, logarithmic dependence on the position. So this is the eigenvalue. And you can see, from this picture, you can see that this is just the first lead. You can obtain this kind of function by expanding x1 minus x2 to 2 delta 0 plus gamma. So this is telling you that what you just computed, what, what you just computed here, which is the coefficient in front of the logarithm, is nothing but uh, the anomalous dimension of the operator. Okay, so this was just generalities, and now I'm going to explain a little bit more in detail, but I'm not going to do the full computation, but explain a little bit more in detail how the computation goes in the case of n equals four super mills at one loop. Is there any questions so far? Yeah, and, and you get the correct powers of log so that it exponentiates. That's the consequence of the conformal symmetry. Yeah, so... Well, well it's, it's really the cutoff. So, so what I'm just saying is that the, the, the Bayer operator that you started with is actually not well-defined quantum operator. So you actually need to kind of define a quantum operator and in order to do that, uh, it's convenient to first introduce a cutoff and then remove the cutoff dependence from the physical quantities. Well, it's the usual renormalization procedure. Okay. So now do the, some explicit computation. So, 
So, okay, so before talking about one loop, let's briefly talk about tree level. And to talk about the tree level, well, as I said, the tree level computation is just a weak contraction, but uh, it is kind of convenient to in introduce some pictorial notation for uh, this tree level weak contraction. So the notation that I'm going to introduce, which is probably also used in Pedro's lecture uh, right after mine, is something like this. So it's essentially the double line notation. But the, the, on, the only point that I wanted to make is that it's convenient to view the single trace operator as some kind of closed circle. And the reason why I draw closed circle for each single trace operator is because uh, in the single trace operator, the indices are contracted in a periodic way. So this circle just represents the index. So for example, I have A here, B here, C here, D here, sorry, and this D, because it's connected to A, it's actually A. And this basically means that you are like a multiplying the field and then uh, multiplying the indices in this way, as you, you and indices in this way. And as you can see, this is nothing but a trace. So this is just a pictorial notation. And, but it's often, uh, tedious to write a double line, so in, in the rest of my lecture, I just write a single line. So maybe I shouldn't write a fourth line. Is small gamma order one over n? Small gamma is order one. Yes, small gamma is order one. I guess this is more than enough for your, for your lecture, right, Pedro? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, all right, so, so now let's do the computations. At, let's see how the computation go, goes at one loop. So essentially, what you need to do at one loop is very simple. So you have the tree level picture and you dress it by the vertices. So, so, but let's try not to do the computation honestly uh, because, because like we are in the bootstrap school and the bootstrap is a way to do the computation dishonestly. So, <laughs> 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 so I'm going to follow that same philosophy. <laughs> so, so at one loop, okay, so let's try to extract some features that you expect from one loop computation. So first of all, okay, so there are like a several ways to dress diagram, but okay, let's consider the one typical one, which is like a gluon exchange. Yeah, okay, let's draw the gluon line by red. So this is a gluon exchange. So these are scalar propagators and it can uh, exchange gluons. And one thing I want to make, one point I want to make is that there can be several different gluon exchange that you can draw. For example, you can draw this one, or you can also connect uh, this one and this one by gluon. But in the large n limit, only one of them survives. So this is uh, easy to see if you kind of go back to the no, uh, double line diagrams. Then you can see that this diagram you can draw on the sphere, but this diagram you can see that it cannot be drawn on the sphere. Okay, yeah, but, th okay. <laughs> so this is because I'm using uh, simplified notation. That thing is a bit uh, complicated, but, so I think what, what you, yeah, it's actually a good point. So I'm gonna expand that point. So expand on that point. So, so I, you have this one. And the contraction I'm talking here is this kind of particular contraction. So this you cannot draw on the sphere. But I think what Peter is saying is this kind of diagram. Okay. Right? So this one you can truly draw on a sphere. So this is okay, but this is non-planar. 
So this is, this is suppressed by one over n. So actually what I meant by this is this one. So, okay, so what is the lesson from this? So the lesson from this is that, uh, as you can see, if you want to connect uh, two lines which are not next to each other, then it, it's gonna be non-planar diagram. Well, actually, yeah, I should have put some lines here because it's like these two are actually next to, need, next to each other. So that was, that was the source of the confusion. But, so the, so the thing that you can learn from this uh, simple uh, observation is that uh, only nearest neighbor interacts in the large n limit. Okay, so, so this is one lesson, lesson one. And so let's also, let's now look at more carefully uh, the structure of the diagram. So over there, I drew glue on exchange diagram, but uh, okay, in n equals four super emissary, there are like a bunch of other interactions that you can draw. So, so now I'm going to talk about like a two, uh, fields inside that diagram because I already discussed that only nearest neighbor interacts. So there are like a several different kinds of diagram. One is coming from scalar quotic interaction. And, and also, as I wrote over there, there is gluon exchange diagram. And there is also some correction to the propagator, which is essentially the self-energy diagram. And if you do the computation, all of them basically gives you a log divergence, and precisely because these two fields are at the same position. But there is actually a sl small difference between this diagram and the other two diagrams. And you can see the difference uh, if you carefully f look at how the O6, O6 indices are contracted. So as I said, I'm going to talk about the operator made up, made up of only SO6 scalars. And so it, each of them has indices. So I, J, K, L, I, J, K, L. And if you just consider how the O and indices are contracted, you can conclude that both of them just gives you this kind of index contraction. And this is precisely because gluon doesn't carry any SO6 charge. On the other hand, this scalar quotic interaction, uh, the only scalar quotic interaction can give you, give you something different. So let's see, let's write down what is the scalar quotic interaction. So the scalar quotic interaction have this form, phi i commutator phi j, and you take square of it. And if you expand, you get trace of phi i, phi j, phi i, phi j, minus trace of phi i, phi i, phi j, phi j. No, maybe not. Uh, it probably it's correct. Phi i, phi j, phi, okay, phi. Yeah, probably I should write something like this. Yeah, and there is also two, right? Yes. But okay, I ignore two. Yeah, because I'm going to do the computation dishonestly. So, <laughs> okay, so there are two different traces. And importantly, it comes with minus sign. Yeah, the latter one comes with minus sign. And let's see what happens if you insert this vertex to here. And as you can clear, easily see that if you insert this vertex, so this vertex has a structure, ordering structure, I, J, I, 
j. So if you follow how the index got, get contracted, it can lead to, it basically leads to this index contraction pattern. And, but the point is that you can insert this vertex in this way, or you can also do the 90 degrees rotation, but both of them leads to the same answer. So I'll put two here. On the other hand, let's consider what this index structure gives you. So this index structure is I, J, J, I. So clearly, if you, if you put this vertex uh, in a usual way, then you get index structure something like this. I go to I and J go to J. But you can also do the 90 degrees rotation and insert it in that picture, and then you get something like this. So in total, uh, you get this kind of index structure. And let's now combine what I observed here with what I just said here. So I was saying that uh, this index, particular index structure can also arise from various different diagrams. And because I didn't compute other diagrams, I cannot fix the coefficient here, but uh, at least I can com com fix the co relative coefficient between this guy and this guy, because we know that this is basically the only contraction that gives you non-trivial SO6 index structure. So, okay, so let's now move on. So this is essentially the index structure that we expect. So, and of course, as I said over here, everything should be proportional to log. Well, this, I'm just computing the coefficient in front of log. But at this point, the, all, I, all I can say is that uh, the final answer for this gamma, which gives you the anomalous dimension matrix, is something like this. So there is some unfixed coefficient over unfixed coefficient, and then I have this, and then I have some unfixed coefficient here, and I have some fixed coefficient here. So, and where L is the length of the operator, because I can insert that particular vertex at any position between two neighboring fields. Now, now comes yet another observation. So, we know due to supersymmetry, this kind of operator is protected. In particular, it doesn't have any anomalous dimension, zero anomalous dimension. This means, okay, so let, let, let me explain what this field means. This is just a, some complex combination of the scalar. And for this kind of fields, Z, which is phi 1 plus I phi 2, there is no contribution from the, this last term because essentially this last term means that there uh, means the contraction of indices between two neighboring fields. But because you are considering complex scalar, which is phi 1 plus I, phi, I times phi 2, so this part actually just gives you zero when acted upon Z, like a two Zs. Which means that this Z only gets contribution from this guy and this guy. And we need to uh, tune the coefficient in such a way that this becomes protected. And this basically forces you to put two here. Because I need to impose the cancellation between the two terms. Now I'm om almost done without doing any explicit computation. So using some input of supersymmetry, I could fix the structure of the anomalous dimension matrix. Unfortunately, I cannot fix the coefficient, overall coefficient without doing any computation. But now, we, because we know the whole structure, you can just compute one particular diagram to read off this coefficient. And if you do so, this, you can fix this coefficient to be minus lambda over 16 pi squared. 
And in the integrability literature, we are using a very confusing notation, and we are, cause, we are calling this particular combination as G squared, uh, which is different from GM mills. But okay, so this is one convention. So by doing this, we succeeded in getting some structure uh, some which governs the anomalous dimension. And as you can clearly see, this, sorry, this is actually acting ice point and i plus one point. And i, ice point and i plus one point. So as you can clearly see, this is already looking a little bit like spin chain. But let me try to make the analogy more precise by considering some particular sector. And in particular, I'm going to consider a sector in which you really get some spin chain which actually appeared in Zohar's lecture. Sorry, uh, L, sorry, yeah, I didn't explain it very explicitly. L is the length of the operator. It's the number of field contains inside single trace. Okay, so. Operators of different lengths don't mix. Good, they don't mix because the reason is because I'm doing the perturbation theory and if you, as long as you do the perturbation theory, the operators which have different classical dimensions do not mix. <coughs> Sorry. At one loop. At one loop, yes. Okay. I mean, so it's true for classical operators, with classical dimensions, with different classical dimensions don't mix, but at higher loops you can find transition. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, that's true, that's certainly true. Ah, right. So the dimension and the length are a bit different concepts and you need to distinguish. Right, so, okay, so let's now consider some reduction to SU2. And then I'm going to talk about what's called beta ansatz in the rest of my talk. Okay. So, so far, I've been using all six different scalars that are contained in n equals 4 super mu theory. But let's consider further subsector, which are made up of just two different scalars, complex scalar. Z is phi 1 plus i phi 2, and x is phi 3 plus i phi 4. And let's see how the Hamiltonian changes. Uh, if we, okay, so how Hamiltonian acts, sorry, not Hamiltonian, this gamma acts. Uh, in that particular states, which are just made up of z and x. And it's actually very easy because, as I said, if you have a complex scalar, z, okay, so this essentially, okay, sorry, this essentially basically gives you the contraction between two neighboring fields, and there are no contraction between z and z, and z and x, and x, x, x and x, so which means that you can basically neglect this factor. So if you neglect that factor, then, uh, what you get is something like this. So you get 8 pi square over lambda and n equals 1 to L. And this is just my, this is the structure. But there is actually, this still doesn't look quite like spin chain but there is yet further nice rewriting of this uh, matrix. So the idea is to regard z as upspin and x as downspin. So let's use this kind of mapping. And if you use this mapping, then you can write this <coughs> in terms of uh, SU2 spin. So here I have i and x, y, z. One quarter minus S and I times dotted S N plus one I.
So this might not be so obvious in the, at first sight. Well, by the way, this n is the, uh, the specifies the uh, sites of the spin chain, and this i runs from x, y, z, runs over x, y, z. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, there is also sum over n. So this sum over n also comes here. Yes. Right. So, well, it's not so clear. It, it might not be so clear, but uh, you can show it by using, rewriting this part in this way. Sn, Sn plus 1, Z plus s n plus s n plus one minus plus s n minus s n plus. So if you rewrite it in this way and then see how it acts on these two neighboring fields, then you can confirm by yourself that this action is the same as the action above. So, but one thing I should point out is that is this minus sign. So because of this minus sign, uh, the system, the Hamiltonian is, of this spin chain is actually not anti-ferromagnetic, as was discussed in Zohar's, le Zohar's lecture, but it's ferromagnetic. But that difference is not so much relevant for the discussion today. Sorry, the reduction to the SU2, yeah, just dropping this term. And if you consider more general operators, then the last term actually con does contribute. Then the further sector which is closed, this is just this ZX sector. Yes, yes, yes. That's the claim. So, Okay, actually the difference of sign is actually important because in this case, so if you, let's view it as a spin chain Hamiltonian, then it turns out in this case it's super easy to construct the ground state because the ground state is just like all spin up. Of course there is all yet another ground state which is all spin down, but I'm gonna focus on this all spin up state. And this state, as you can see, this state actually has zero uh, eigenvalue, and it precisely corresponds to this particular operator that I discussed here. And all the other states can be uh, obtained by flipping, for example, several, uh, several spins. And in the, in the statistical mechanic context, this flip flipped spin is also often called magnons because you can view it as excitation on top of this ground state vacuum. So let's talk about one magnon ground state. Sorry, not one magnon ground state, one magnon excited state. So I'm gradually moving to the direction of integrability. So one magnon state is spanned by this kind of state. So this is essentially just like a, con this is a state which has only one down spin at n n's position. And let's consider the action of the Hamiltonian to this n. Sorry, I'm so, let's already, yeah, let's also call it h. So let's call, let's discuss the action of the Hamiltonian on this n. Uh, I'm just regarding it as a Hamiltonian. I'm just calling it an as a Hamiltonian. Yes, yes. So, okay. Uh, okay, so at this point, I'm just calling it Hamiltonian because it looks like a Hamiltonian of the spin chain. And, but of course, as I discussed before, its eigenvalue has a meaning of anomalous dimension. So you can view this Hamiltonian as a dilatation operator. Let's act H, it's, it's very easy. So like Hamiltonian consists of two terms, one is identity and one is this like a permutation. And if you act the Hamiltonian to up up, then identity and permutation cancels out. 
So the only non-trivial contribution can be obtained by acting the Hamiltonian uh, to, ne to, to pair of states which contains downspin. And if you act identity, you get two times n. So you can act identity here or here. And if you act permutation, then the position of this magnum shift by one, so you get this. Is this clear? How? Uh, how? Okay. Yeah. So I'm just. So you want to go from start to X in some way, but as an X or. Okay, so uh, I'm not trying to relate this and this. I'm just like a considering a, a different set of operator, which yeah. can also be eigenstate of this. Okay, so and if you look at this, then you cl clearly see that this is just discrete Laplacian. So because it's a, it is a discrete Laplacian, you can easily construct the eigenstate. And the eigenstate should be given by some plane wave. So, so this means that eigenstate is given by this kind of structure, e to i t n. So this has to, this should be your, the correct eigenstate. Uh, but there, uh, there is yet another condition that I need to consider, which is a periodicity. So this kind of form is always the correct, always gives you the correct eigenstate of the Hamiltonian if the spin chain is inf infinitely long. But we know that the spin chain is not infinitely long and it's periodic. So in particular, if I write something like L plus one here, I should identify it as one. So this basically forces you to identifying the factor coming here. So L plus one with N equals one. And this gives you periodicity condition E to IPL equals one. And of course, this is very familiar periodicity condition in a finite volume. Okay, uh, that doesn't happen in this case. And the reason is because uh, SZ yeah. is actually preserved. Uh, SZ actually commutes with the Hamiltonian and it has different SZ. So they are in a two different super selection, sec different sectors. The total magnetization in Z axis commutes with the Hamiltonian. So they can't mix. Okay, so now, so let's see. So what I wanted to say is, so, so this is the condition that you need to impose in P. And because we know the form of the wave function as well, we can also compute uh, eigenvalue uh, of this Hamiltonian. And it's given by lambda over four pi squared times one minus cosine P. Well, the reason why you get my one minus cosine p is because the Hamiltonian is essentially the discrete Laplacian, but let's call it E of b. So now, now finally, I'm going to talk about something related to the integrability. So this one magnum computation was kind of trivial because the Hamiltonian was just discrete Laplacian. But now I'm going to talk about something that's related to integrability. And okay. So the relation with the integrability you can see it in the two magnum state. 
So let's consider the two magnon states. And in the same way, I can level the state to, of two magnon states in this way. NMM. And one observation is that because the Hamiltonian uh, that I erased right now is nearest neighbor, if N and, M, N and M are far separated each other, essentially the Hamiltonian acts on each magnon indiv individually. H acts individually. So this means that the form of the wave function that we want to compute, consider, shouldn't be so different from the plane wave wave function. So let's consider the wave function, which contains magnum with momentum P1 and P2. Then uh, the natural ansatz for the wave function is something like this. And the summation is over n smaller than m. And I put the plane wave. And then I put n and m here. But in fact, there is actually yet another plane wave that you can draw, which you can obtain by permuting P1 and P2. And in general, the correct wave function is expected to be a linear combination of two plane wave with some coefficient. So let's call this coefficient S of P1 and P2 and try to fix what is the correct S of P1 and P2. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, that's enough, that's enough actually. That's enough. But before doing this computation, I can already like a guess what is the energy of this state. Because as I said, energy of this, uh, the Hamiltonian acts almost individually when they are far separated. We expect the energy of this uh, two particle state should be the sum of the energy of the one particle state. So let's take that ansatz and plug in in this eigenvalue equation. And in particular, let's look at the term where on both sides, which is, let's look at the look at the terms where two downspins are next to each other because this is particularly the term that you need to worry about because the previous argument doesn't directly apply when there are two uh, magnons next to each other. <coughs> and let's see what kind of term, uh, so what is the coefficient of this particular ket in the right hand side. And in the right hand side it's very clear. What I get is just this one times psi of n, n plus 1, where psi of n, n plus 1 is, so I'm going to call this as psi of n, n. So this is just a wave function. So the right-hand side is just given by this. And and left-hand side, so there are like a multiple ways to get to this configuration. And I'm just going to write them all. This is just a trivial exercise. This, yeah. So, and there is yet another term, uh, minus psi n, n plus two. So this is the uh, what you get from the left-hand side. And actually, the first two terms are the same. And the reason why I separated is 
because the first, this three comes from the action of identity and this minus comes from the action of permutation. So what you are supposed to do is to just equate left hand side and right hand side and then compute unfixed coefficient f, s. And if you do so, uh, you get, so let me just write the final result, sp1 and p2 is equal to minus 1 plus e2 i, p1 plus p2 minus e2, 2 times e2 i p2 over 1 plus e2 i, p1 plus p2 minus 2 times e2 i p1. So this looks a little bit complicated, but there is actually a nice variable which brings this s into a rational function. So the variable is called rapidity variable. So if you introduce the variable uk in this way, then this s matrix becomes u1 minus u2 minus i over u1 minus u2 plus i. So you can check it very easily. I have something like 10 minutes, right? Or maybe more? Uh, yeah, you said 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Okay, so so far so good. And so in this way, I could uh, determine the structure of the wave function, and and the energy is, is just given by the sum of the energy of these two guys. But as in the case of one magnon state, uh, I also need to impose yet another condition, which is the periodicity. So periodicity, in this case, is like this. So you have S psi of N and M. Uh, this should be equal to psi of M and N plus, uh, N plus L. And I'm assuming that N is smaller than M. Well, this is just a usual, this is just a kind of two particle, gener natural two particle generalization of the periodicity condition. Because putting a particle at n's position and m's position should be the same as putting a particle m's position and n plus l's position. And if you saw, if you require this equation, then in the end, uh, you get, yeah, I should be able to write the beta equation. So you get, this equation, so E to I P K L. So I'm going to write it in a way that it can be generalized to the multi-particle state. S P K P J equals one. So of course in the case of two particle, then like uh, this product is not really a product, this is a, just a single S matrix, but I just wrote it in, the, in this way because this can be generalized to multi-particle states. So let me just explain what is the physical meaning of this equation. So of course it came from the uh, periodicity condition, but it has a very natural physical meaning. So this E to IPL is precisely the phase factor the magnum acquires when magnum goes around the circle. So in the presence, if you don't have any other particles, then the phase factor is just that. And that's why I got the equation E to IPL equals one in the case of one magnon state. But in the case of two magnon states, when it goes around the circle, it first hits the other magnon and that produces this S matrix phase shift. And essentially this equation is requiring that the uh, total phase shift must be one in order to have a periodic wave function. So this is essentially coming from the phase shift. So let me just now, so 
So now, so far, I analyzed the one particle state and two particle state. But as you can see from this discussion, because the Hamiltonian is nearest neighbor, uh, the only subtlety arises when, they are, when the magnons are next to each other. And essentially, the wave function are up, up to that subtlety, the wave function are just sum of plane waves. And if you do the computation for the multi-particle case, you actually find that this same structure persists also for a multi-particle case. So let me just write the correct uh, wave function for the three particle. And it turns out, in the case of three particle, the correct wave function is given by something like this. So you have n1, n2, and n3. And there is a one term, e2 i p1 n1 plus p2 n2 plus p3 n3. And there is a second term, s p1 p2. So now there is a plane wave where the momenta are permuted, sorry, p1 n2 plus p3 n3. And then, so there is yet another term. Well, there are actually many terms, but I'm going to write only a sum of several of them. So, then everything multiplies to n1, n2, n3. So this is the structure of the, the wave function that you can fix by doing the computation for the three particle. Well, actually, if you do the computation for the three particle, you immediately realize that the same structure persists also for the multi-particle case. And I guess that's how people first solve this model, probably. So, but, okay, so the structure of the wave function looks a little bit complicated, but there is a simple pattern. So, essentially, the so wave function is given by sum over permutation. And so for each permutation, this, you can draw some lines. For example, if it's a permutation which uh, maps 1, 2, 3 to 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, then you can draw this kind of line. And if you draw this kind of line, then you see, for example, in this case, there are two cross, crosses. And for each, the rule of the game is to multiply the weight S matrix to, uh, for each cross, and then multiply the wave function, which is given by permutation, sorry of momentum, uh, k and k. So the term that I wrote here is precisely the term that I wrote uh, in the last line of this blackboard. Ah, uh, good point. I think that you are right. Yeah, thank you. So this kind of structure persists. And you can actually check that this is indeed giving a correct wave function. Right. Here, right. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Thank you for pointing it out. So this is the structure of wave function. And then once you fix, so, so the, already here I can point out to one important thing. So one important thing is that all the factor which appears here is just a product of this like a two particle uh, factor. And this is actually indication of the S matrix and it's related to the factorization of the S matrix that I discussed earlier, uh, that I discussed in the previous lecture. And 
but I don't have time to explain the detail of the connection between this and Young Baxter equation. But, uh, but the point is that once, once you fix the structure of this matrix, yeah, as I was saying, that there is yet another uh, condition that, I, that you need to impose, which is the periodistic condition. But essentially, uh, also from the periodistic condition, you get the same kind of expression. And this is indeed the correct equation for the multiparticle case. And this equation is called Bete equation. Right, so in this case, S doesn't have index, so it's a kind of trivial, but if it has the index, then you need to, well, you need to check that it satisfies the ambassador for consistency. Okay, so, so basically I'm done, but let me just make comment about higher loop generalization in one minute and mention what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So at higher loop, The computation is very complicated. So even if you do the dishonest way of computation that I explained today, it's, it's still very hard to do the high end loop computation. One difficulty is that at one loop, I was saying that there is only nearest neighbor interaction. But for example, at two loop, you can write this kind of diagram, which means that actually the interaction is no longer nearest neighbor. So the expectation is that at L loop, you get the spin chain with uh, L body interaction. Sorry, L nearest neighbor. L, L nearest neighbor. Interaction. So this is expectation, but first of, there are actually two difficulties. First of all, it's actually very hard to do the Feynman diagram computation to get the L-loop computation, L-loop uh, gamma, which corresponds to Hamiltonian needle spin chain. And the second difficulty is that even if you get the explicit Hamiltonian of the spin chain, now the Hamiltonian that you get is not the nearest neighbor, so not the standard one for which you know how to uh, diagonalize. So the, comp the diagonalization itself gets a little bit more complicated. Well, it's actually very, becomes more com much more complicated. So in the next lecture, uh, I'm gonna talk about how to uh, kind of avoid all these procedures and just talk about uh, the ingredients that appears in this finer ex equation. So that's that's where the uh, integrable bootstrap comes in, and that's going to be the topic of tomorrow. Thank you.